Today, I'm talking with Jonathan Wilson Hargrove. He is a celebrated spiritual writer and sought-after speaker, a native of North Carolina. He is a graduate of Eastern University and Duke Divinity School. In 2003, Jonathan and his wife, Leah, founded the Rootba House, a house of hospitality where the formerly homeless share community with the formerly housed. Jonathan directs the School for Conversion, a popular education center that works to make surprising friendships possible. He's also an associate minister at the historically black St. John's Missionary Baptist Church. Jonathan is a co-complier of the celebrated Common Prayer, All Liturgy for Ordinary Radicals, and the author of several books on Christian spirituality, including Reconstructing the Gospel, Strangers at My Door, The Awakening of Hope, The Wisdom of Stability, and The New Monasticism. He's also co-author with Reverend Dr. William Barber II of The Third Reconstruction, Moral Mondays, Fusion Politics, and the Rise of a New Justice Movement. An evangelical Christian who connects with the broad spiritual tradition and its monastic witnesses, Jonathan is a leader in the Red Letter Christian Movement and the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. He speaks often about emergent Christianity and faith in public life to churches and conferences across the denominational spectrum and has given lectures at dozens of universities and seminaries, including Calvin College, MIT, Bethel, Duke, Yale, Princeton, Jewish Theological, Perkins, Wake Forest, St. John's, DePaul, and Baylor. Enjoy this conversation that I had with uh, Jonathan Wilson Hargrove. Uh, I very much did, and hopefully we can continue to learn some and get mad. Uh, all right, here we go. Well, welcome, brothers and sisters, again to another episode of the Get Mad Crusade. Today we have Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Um, quick, like, so two backstory things that I had in my mind that I wanted to bring up as we kind of got started. One is, I don't, Jonathan probably doesn't realize this, but like, Jonathan played a major role in my life probably 15 years ago. He wrote a book, New Monasticism, and uh, another big key figure in that movement was Shane Claiborne. And both Shane's book and your book ignited what I, I guess, arguably for better or for worse, was several years of living in intentional community in Atlanta. Certainly. With a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it had its bumps, but I would say like that that time period and that drive to live out this new monastic idea was mm. very uh, imprinted on, on my life, my heart, my mind. Um, and I think made, it played a big role. So uh, reaching all the way back to 15 years ago, that was a fun period that you had an influence on. Um, but yeah. Um, We're glad to reconnect and be with you here. Yeah, definitely. So as you guys heard in the bio, Jonathan has written a lot of books. He's written a lot of books with, with co-authors, some really prominent people. Um, and Jonathan just does some really awesome work in everything from activism to voting rights to uh, the Poor People's Campaign. Um, but here we are this month with Christian Nationalism and Jonathan's most recent book, Revol uh, Revolution of Values, really dives pretty deep into, uh, I guess the tagline being, how the religious right taught America to misread the Bible. Yeah. So I guess I kind of want to just dive into some history. Jonathan, could you dig a little bit with us on slaveholder religion, which you talk about in your book? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think folks have been digging into this question of like, why do we read the Bible the way we do? And uh, uh, there's, there's been, uh, you know, some, uh, popular books and podcasts around this conversation. Sometimes people talk about deconstruction and, you know, what do we need to rethink in terms of the way cultural formation has shaped the way we read the Bible. Uh, this historian, uh, Kristen Dumay did a really good book on Jesus and John Wayne that kind of looks at that and the way that, you know, people who say these are our biblical values or, you know, always reading the culture as much as the Bible when they're sort of talking about um, what, what, what the values are in scripture. So I, I think that's an important conversation that's happening right now. And um, as I've been sorting through this, uh, you know, as someone who really grew up in uh, the, the, the movement that, uh, that, that tried to shape so-called biblical and traditional values around a particular conservative vision of the world at the moment when um, politically in this country, a coalition had formed that had pushed civil rights and women's rights and environmental rights in the 1960s and 70s. Um, 
I, you know, uh, the, the so-called religious right and the moral majority that emerged in the 1980s was a, was a reaction to that in an attempt to kind of, uh, uh, you know, reclaim uh, the culture, not in terms of racial identity, but in terms of religious identity. Um, uh, having kind of grown up in that and grappled with it, I was uh, particularly drawn to trying to understand why this had been so convincing to white people. Uh, because there are black Christians, and there are brown Christians, and there are Asian Christians, who uh, uh, native Christians who are not as uh, persuaded by this argument, but uh, white folks have gone along with it, um, and really kind of across the theological spectrum, white folks went along with it. And so, I, you know, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. Uh, our church was sort of all in, and is still probably the largest engine uh, in terms of church institutions of Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to understand why we were particularly susceptible to it. And so I started uh, going back and trying to understand how uh, our ancestors learned to read the Bible in order to justify enslaving other people. And uh, those arguments were written down because, um, you know, powerful people uh, wanted that to be uh, not just the law of the land, but the kind of morally sanctioned way of uh, running this economy for hundreds of years. So, that, you know, you can go back in the libraries and read the arguments that were made to justify it. And what struck me when I studied that was that uh, people don't argue anymore for race-based slavery, but the way people argued for it with the scriptures is very similar to the way we argue today for conservative values, traditional values, uh, even concepts like liberty um, that we talk about. Uh, I mean, the, the way the reactionary Christian nationalist movement today talks about liberty is identical to the way slaveholders talked about liberty in the 19th century uh, because they wanted a liberty that was, you know, freedom from a government that would tell them what to do with their property. Mm. When, of course, it was the government who had sanctioned uh, the fact that people could be treated as property. Um, and I think that uh, slaveholder religion, that, that's really the name that Frederick Douglass gave to it when he was challenging it in the 19th century. He said, between the Christianity of the slaveholder and the Christianity of Christ, I see the widest possible difference. Mm -hmm. And he was an abolitionist and he was determined to uh, uh, get rid of slavery and the Christianity that supported it. But he was himself a Christian and, you know, used the prophetic texts of scripture to challenge the practice of owning other human beings. And I think he gave us this category of a kind of religion that accommodates itself to the plantation capitalism that has morphed and continued to be exploitative in this country and that drives a lot of the uh, political uh, conflicts that we continue to have in this country. They, they are in fact encouraged in order to maintain the basic power structure of plantation capitalism as it was built uh, on stolen land and the backs of stolen labor um, here in the South where I live. So, so that's the, uh, the legacy of slaveholder religion as I came in. And, 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 I, and I guess I, I should say that I started trying to understand that and to parse out how that is different from the gospel that Jesus preached, because I realized just as a person who loves Jesus, I realized that slaveholder religion was keeping me from knowing the fullness of what Jesus promises. And I wanted that for myself. I also wanted it for other people. And, um, and so, you know, there's, if, if you study the scriptures closely, there's nothing more dangerous than uh, uh, calling something that is not of God, godly, because then you, you end up worshiping a false God in the name of the God who made us. And uh, that's a hard thing to get untangled from. So that's why I've, I've been trying to name slaveholder religion and, uh, and preach a gospel that helps us get free from it. Because I really do think it harms all of us. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say, you kind of mentioned some of the power dynamics and even uh, through in capitalism there. 
what would you say are like maybe the top few ways that those things still exist? Um, whether, you know, especially post uh, civil rights movement in sixties, what were some of the ways that they maintain that even maybe before the moral majority really took off in the seventies, yeah, uh, yeah. but then especially afterwards, what, what were some of the main categories where they were still suppressing the non-white person? Well, we actually have really good data on this. Uh, um, if you look at uh, disparities based on race in everything from wealth to educational opportunities to uh, health outcomes uh, to, I mean, let's bring it right up to the present. If you look at the racial disparities when it comes to the impact of COVID on communities, uh, all across the board, all the data says that um, black and brown people, black and brown communities suffer disproportionately from uh, you know anything that's bad and and have a, a, a disproportionate lack of access to anything that is advantageous. Um, mm -hmm. You know, education, health care, good wages, whatever it might be. And so, if that's true, then you either have to believe that there's something inherently wrong with black people. That's a racist idea, right? I think everybody recognizes. Like, if you, if you think black people as a group are inherently inferior to white people, that's racist. Or I think the alternative explanation is you have to say there are there's something about the system, the society that we've set up that consistently reproduces these outcomes. And um, if that's the case, then uh, it's something we could do something about. Um, as James Baldwin used to say, you know, we made the world that we're living in and we have to make it over again. Uh, now, that's not you know, in any way to, you know, challenge the role that the creator of all things had in making it. Uh, but, but nobody thinks that God made the world uh, in such a way that, you know, some people suffer disproportionately. Uh, so we made these laws, we made these structures, we made the, you know, we, we set up the economy the way it is. And, um, and we know consistently from, you know, all kinds of research has been done that these disparities exist. So I think the uh, the the work of undoing structural racism or systemic racism is, uh, is is simply the work of recognizing that these disparities exist and that there are policy decisions that we could make that would reduce the disparities. And what I often uh, you know say, and I think is incredibly important for people who think of themselves as white to realize, is that when those approaches have been tested, you know, th things that are meant to address that gap that exists, they have historically always helped white people, right? Uh, you go back to the Reconstruction era and uh, in the South, you know, the, the huge disparity that Black folks who had political power after the Civil War for the first time insisted that they had to have access to was education. They said, if our kids have education, like others have education, they will be able to make it in this society. Well, they did that by insisting that there be universal public education. We hadn't had that in the South before. You know, Massachusetts, most places had it, but we hadn't had that here. Uh, poor white folks didn't go to school at much more than poor black folks did. And so um, access to public education is really the result of black political power in the South. Uh, when black folks had a chance to speak and to vote, they voted for people who uh, taxed the plantation owners in order to have public schools. And um, simply by numbers, more white people benefited from those public schools than black folks. Um, so when we take universal measures to address racial disparities, uh, this is what I think is critical for people to understand, it, it ends up helping everybody. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, and so this this narrative of like the makers versus the takers right. is really just meant to pit people against one another. Right. As a matter of fact, you know, any universal program that's about equal access and promotion of justice for everyone is going to help most people. <laughs> and uh, if, you know, the corporations who, you know, are essentially robbing all of us have to pay a little bit more in order for those programs to exist. Um, it can't be said in any real sense that that hurts them. 
right? <laughs> because you know there there are lots of places in the world where corporations do just fine paying much higher taxes than they do here. So uh, all that to say that um, I, I think there's a good historical argument for um, uh, what's sometimes called anti-racist policies or policies that you right. know intentionally try to address systemic disparities. Uh, actually helping everyone, uh, even those people who think that it's going to hurt us if we help them. Right. Yeah. So you touched on education. So that makes me kind of want to jump forward because this is a direct line to where we are today and how Christian nationalism plays a significant role is, uh, is education and the private school system. Yeah. The, 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 well, Liberty University. So I guess maybe talk to us a little bit about how that started. Uh, I don't have the exact year off the top of my head, but kind of the, uh, the fall. Well, I don't know if that was something that came exactly out of Jay Lindsay Almond's campaign or where the, the private school system exactly started, but yeah, maybe touch on, on something like that and how that, kind of kept that pretty brushstroke of like without saying anything too aggressive or racist maintained that power structure through yeah. the private school system that got started. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's widely recognized that the beginning of the civil rights movement is the Brown decision in 54. Mm -hmm. So that's a Supreme court decision that uh, uh, said that racial segregation in the schools was unconstitutional. Um you know, that reversed court precedent. And it meant that the practice of education had to change. Uh, of course, there were lots of fights. One of the first was called massive resistance in Virginia. And uh, Virginia actually shut down the public schools uh, in order to keep from having to uh, desegregate them. And there were local committees that formed, uh, you know, of uh, they called themselves sovereignty committees and they were committed to resisting Brown. And uh, Jerry Falwell was a Baptist preacher who was not involved in politics before that, but he volunteered to be the chaplain for his local sovereignty committee. So this was his entree into politics. And um, uh, when he goes on to lead the moral majority, uh, you know, almost 15 years later, uh, he has been politicized by a movement that is a reaction against the uh, political gains of that civil rights movement and the women's movement and uh, uh, ecological justice movement, anti-war movement, all, you know, all of which were trying to uh, challenge the federal government on um, injustices that impacted different communities in different ways. But the narrative that got developed and that Falwell became a spokesperson for was that these changes to uh, the American way of life, changes that were explicitly designed to address historic injustices, those changes were uh, framed as a challenge to our traditional values, and those so-called traditional values were uh, equated with biblical values. So now, you know, to suggest that uh, uh, Black people uh, have equal citizenship rights with white people to suggest that women have equal constitutional rights with men in this country, which was simply what the uh, Equal Rights Amendment said. Um, and a lot of the energy was around resisting that am amendment. That was Phyllis Schaffer's whole, whole campaign, Stop the ERA. Um, all of that was framed as a threat to our Christian way of life. So you see, it was tied very closely to the Christianity of uh, white Southern culture. And I think uh, while Falwell as a fundamentalist Baptist preacher was, was largely only appealing to uh, white Southerners, uh, increasingly this religious right grew and recognized that, that there was a kind of a, a cultural resonance, not just with white Southerners, but also with white folks in the suburbs of cities all around the country, with white folks across the Sun Belt and out in California. And so uh, it was really a political coalition of, of white people and white culture that was uh, uh, energized by the defensiveness 
of people who were convinced that if things were better for other people, it would be worse for them. And that that was a threat not to their racial identity, but to their religious identity, to their Christian faith. And so Christian nationalism became a very organized and well-funded movement to, uh, to, to create and reinforce an identity that connected religious faith to that reactionary conservatism. Yeah, I guess we've talked about this in a few other interviews, but would you say that part of that driving force back then and today was tied up in that theology of God blessing this nation as a chosen nation and and using it as a beacon to the world and kind of that manifest destiny? Would you say it's kind of rooted in that ultimate like cradle of understanding of, of America as even though the founding fathers didn't seem to really like portray that a lot of times, is yeah. that a lot of the root? I think it's a, it's a narrative that conveniently allowed people to sort of find a tradition that they could plug this into. But it, mm. I, I think historically it's pretty clear that it was rooted in the, the, the very visceral reaction people were having to changes that they perceived as being dangerous to them and their way of life, right? Yeah. Um, that's what drove, you know, the George Wallace politics of the South in the 60s. Mm -hmm. George Wallace was a Methodist Sunday school teacher who the first time he ran for public office didn't say much of anything about race. And he got beat in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And he told people who knew him that he was not going to be out in again by a politician. So his very virulent racism was a response to the culture, right, of the South at the time that was reacting against the challenge of the civil rights movement. Well, when Wallace runs for president, Wallace realizes that he has people who love him in, you know, New York City. He, he does well in Indiana, you know, in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, this is a, I mean, he runs as an independent, but he's a real threat to Richard Nixon in 68 politically because he's, a, he's, he's connecting with this white base. Mm -hmm. And that leads to the development of a Southern strategy um, within the Republican Party that is really about um, not using that explicit racism that had, you know, uh, demonized Southerners in so much of the country, but using that impulse, that impulse to say our way of life is being threatened uh, um, and, and our way of life. Uh, we're not going to call it white culture, but we're going to call it traditional culture. We're going to call it Christian mm -hmm. culture. Okay. Uh, yeah. Our way of life is under threat is, in fact, the very foundation of this country. It's what this country was built upon. And while you're right, that that position, to the extent that it exists, was very much a minority position among the founders and, frankly, at most points in U.S. history, uh, the people who wanted to argue that, you know, found every shred of evidence they could to create a through line. Right. So that, that, right. that they could say that, you know, from the time the, right. you know, the, the ship showed up at Plymouth Rock to the present, this has been the heart of uh, the American story. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great historian, John Faya, who's been writing on this for years and, and has really just historically shown that, you know, Christian nationalism is, is, is a minority uh, viewpoint uh, in terms of, you know, most of U.S. history. But nevertheless, it was a convenient story and it was pushed very hard by a networked uh, um, a group of not just people who were involved in politics, but people who were involved in building culture. Right. Yeah. So yeah. media organizations, mm -hmm. uh, 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 educational institutions, nonprofit organizations, churches, you know, the NRA, the Women for Liberty, the, you know, all these groups that, uh, that that literally met, started meeting together uh, through something called the Council for National Policy and having hundreds of millions of dollars invested in them by uh, you know very wealthy families and corporations who understood that it was to their advantage to push this narrative in order to hold on to power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really helpful way to see it because I, I feel like I, as I've been learning, I, originally this month was started as pretty much strictly purity culture. And a lot of that was 
me swinging my pendulum of going, well, this is how I was raised. Let's, let's talk about Joshua Harris and all this stuff. And it yeah, quickly yeah. evolved into, whoa, all this stuff points back to the same, the same base, which is Christian nationalism. But it's interesting because I feel like I've really focused in on this idea of how people viewed America as a chosen nation. But that's actually interesting because what I hear you saying is like it was a convenient narrative, but really it was a narrative used. If anything, it it almost feels like it was maybe a narrative used for those who didn't understand as much people who just would listen to those in power and had the voice, uh, but truly was a power thing and a structural thing. Um, and, and, and I mean, I just, it obviously takes me back to 2016 of just like this idea of it, it, they, they really have it down how they say it. It's, it's, you are threatened. Yeah. And I guess this plays into this culture of fear. You are threatened yeah. your way of life, your traditional values. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, obviously whether true or not really easy to get visceral and go Ugh, like, yeah, I, I, you know, and, and I guess maybe that's why people hone in on one one topic like abortion or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, OK, so. I'm curious then for you to kind of talk about, like, why the family value movement kind of with government, I guess you know, we talked quickly about Falwell, but like. I mean, it seems like it all roots back to that very thing, right? threatening way of life. So let us have a voice politically. Let us raise ourselves up to fight this battle. And it hasn't stopped since. Yeah. And the the thing that I emphasize, you know, this is as somebody who grew up in a rural white community is that the people who pushed this and organized it, they did it to use us. Mm. And I think that's critically important because a, a lot of times rural white communities, you know, feel attacked when this narrative is challenged, but I challenge it because I know very concretely how it hurt my community. It's it's important to realize that this started during the war on poverty, right? 1970s war on poverty. I mean, the the consensus, the political consensus had become that, you know, a majority of people recognized that the government needed to take action to address the just obstacles to basic opportunity that exists in this country, you know, housing, education, whatever. So, I mean, my parents got an FHA loan to buy a house. Like that's very concretely, you, you know, a, a policy that comes out of this era that lower income white folks were benefiting from. Mm-hmm. They came after us and told us your values are being threatened so that they could take that stuff away. Right. So the community I grew up in became poorer because it was voting for people who said they were going to represent our values. And by pitting us against the black folks, against the immigrants, against women uh, or women's rights, uh, they were renegotiating power in such a way that they were giving us what uh, uh, I think W.B. Du Bois wisely called the psychological wages of whiteness. Right. That's what he called it back in the early 20th century. The psychological wages of whiteness, while literally making making it uh, economically more difficult for most white people and black people and brown people. But I'm just saying they were exploiting the very communities they were appealing to. I mean, (laughs) I like talking about this subject, it, it makes me. Like I'm, I'm already angry and I'm naturally a cynic. So like your shows get mad, it's get mad, but it's, like well, I'm also, telling you why I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes me more mad because I see these people and I've thought about this a lot. Actually, I thought about like rural white people. I grew up in a rural white, literally like Forsyth County known to be one of the most racist places in the late eighties. And, and so I, I grew up in it as well. And it's like, I, I can see how it hurt people. And that's why it's like so clear to me. I'm just thinking, I, I just, hey, guys, think about this for a second. Like, and then this is where the conversation gets interesting because I, I, I don't even know if it's possible anymore. I get really, I do get cynical because I go, how can we engage in conversation where people are willing to listen? Um, 
and 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 it's 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 hard um but it feels hopeless especially when you know everything on social media is is useless basically and and so but i but i i feel that i feel that way of like if if the people who are being tricked if you will on that psychological wages of, of whiteness um if they just understood some of the basic principles of how they're actually being impacted negatively um and that maybe their values aren't being threatened as much though. Obviously the media likes to, it seems like the media likes to really heighten this like culture war of right versus left. So I guess if you think the only other option is this pendulum swing over here, then yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe you think the only option is this thing. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, I, I talk to us about maybe some of the work you do with those conversations is poor people's campaign kind of one of the ways you guys engage with, with that conversation with, with different folks? Well, I've been encouraged by the Poor People's Campaign precisely because it brings people together around issues that directly impact them. Mm-hmm. So the first time the Poor People's Campaign came to my home county in North Carolina, Stokes County, uh, we gathered at a church to listen to people who had been impacted by coal ash ponds, right? What... What did the so-called family value Republicans who we had elected to the state legislature, what did they do with the utility and the power companies? They deregulated them. They said, oh, business is better when there's not much government regulation. So we're not going to look too closely. Well, what did the power company do to make money? They took the ash from the coal that they burn and they put it in these ponds that were not uh, in any way contained. So the heavy metals in the ponds seep into the groundwater and everybody who has a well drinks that water. So the cancer rates up there are out the roof. Mm. And we sat there and listened to black people and white people talk about these weird health conditions that they started having and they were going to their doctors. You know, everybody has to go down to the doctors in Winston-Salem because there's not any major hospital there. So they were seeing some of the same doctors and they started telling them something's going on here. That Literally, a community has been poisoned because corporations have been deregulated by people who said they were representing their values. And when you can get that concrete with people, people begin to see, oh, this is, this is not uh, pro-family. As a matter of fact, my family's dying, right? We're, we're or, or we're spending all of our time, you know, trying to get treatment because we've been poisoned, and uh, those kinds of things bring people together. I think in a way that can help shift the moral narrative, you know, where we're not just arguing about, um, you know, what people think about abortion. I mean, abortion is always going to be a complex and controversial issue. And, you know, it's there's a lot to sort through. I think it's convenient for this movement, though, because by giving people this so-called moral clarity on one thing, they can then do whatever they want on all these other things. And uh, I think it has effectively distracted people from the ways that the policy position of the so-called pro-life and pro-family movement for the last 40 years uh, has hurt most poor and low income communities. So the Poor People's Campaign is actively organizing poor and low income people across race, class, I mean, you know, ge- geography, uh, right. in order to uh, help people see that most of us would benefit if we change the conversation about what the moral issues are, right? Yeah. Let's, let's not endlessly debate about what kind of, you know, complicated decision a mother has to make or, you know, who people are sleeping with. And let's talk about things that we can actually make policy about, you know, that affects everybody. Like, you know, what sort of what sort of wages do you earn if you work in this society? Right. And can you live on those wages? Uh, do, do you have access to health care? Mm-hmm. I mean, make whatever decisions you and your doctor decide about your health care, but do you have access to Like, Can you see a doctor? (laughs) These are are life and death issues that people are uh, um, 
not talking about because we've gotten so stuck on these culture wars. A hundred percent. And, and I, you know, it reminds me of uh, the meme of, you know, the rich guy with a monocle looking into the glass of two people fighting and it's just like culture war, but what's mm. really going on is this classist war. Mm. And there's way more of us uh, in the, in the poor category and mm. the economic inequality category Um I mean, it's a bug's life, right? Like if all the ants who are all the people not, not getting enough from, you know, whatever the trickle down economics. And, that, and that's why these conversations fascinate me because, it, you know, the video for those who have seen, have seen it, where we, we, you know, we basically launched the campaign with Reagan. The whole reason I launched with that is because I feel like there was so much rooted in that one time period where yeah. we just came out of this movement of, of, morality and and shifting to really create a a, a multi-ethnic democracy which you yeah. talk about a good bit in your book and i love that and and uh yet not only the economic side of reaganomics but everything from the war on poverty the war on drugs it all seems connected and yeah. yet the wealth gap has increased and yet we're still fighting this moral battle of values being threatened um I feel, I feel like I'm going to have to join you guys sometime with poor people's campaign. I, I feel like maybe it'll help me like kind of let it off my chest and just watch like some really positive conversation. You know what I mean? And like hear people come together on the issues that actually matter. Like that. I think when they can get their mind off of what they see on, on Fox news or whatever um, they're focused on, Oh wait, actually. Yeah. Like yeah. I haven't had a good insulation or I haven't had this or the uh, water's uh, defective because of these corporations. Um, I think that's right. I mean, I think what this movement has been saying is like, we don't just need a pendulum swing in the other direction. We really need to change what the conversation is about. Mm, and yeah. when you put poor and low income people's voices at the center and let them speak about what directly impacts them, I think that's the best chance we have of changing the conversation. Just so those who are with us know, um, June 18th, the poor people's campaign is having a mass Moral Assembly and March on Washington in D.C. There are hundreds of buses leaving from communities all over the country. If you want to get on one, you can just go to poorpeoplescampaign.org and sign up. It's a good, go. good way to get involved right away. Yeah, I highly, uh, we'll have that link in the show notes and we'll be promoting it. We'll do several things. I would love for people who see this to happen to get involved. And uh, we actually will be on the road ourselves, so we might be able to, to connect with that. All right. Um, so uh, uh, maybe uh, let's turn this a little optimistic. Tell, tell us a little bit about moral fusion organizing. What is that, and and why is you know why is it positive, and what what are you guys seeing happen in some of the, the organizing you're doing? Yeah. Um, well, you know, fusion organizing is just recognizing that the same powers that uh, make it very difficult for us to take action on living wages are also making it difficult to have any kind of conversation about access to health care. It's the same political powers that are making it impossible to address the climate crisis in any meaningful way. You know, this, this, the same powers that make it impossible to uh, challenge the war economy and the way our military budget just grows and grows and grows every year. Mm. Um, so, you know, when we recognize, so, so a lot of political organizing happens out, you know, if it's outside of the parties, it happens around specific issues. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that makes sense. People who are most affected by something get involved with an organization. You know, if you care about the earth, you join the Sierra Club. If you care about, right. you know, uh, uh, this or that, you, you, you join the organization connected to it. But fusion organizing is about saying, you know, if if, if so many of this, these issues uh, are blocked by the same basic powers, then we need to fuse the organizing and the movements uh, in, in order to build power together. And it's a moral movement, moral fusion organizing, uh, because uh, the argument is that if you're going to challenge Christian nationalism, uh, you have to offer a moral framework, right, that's big enough to help 
you know, Christians have frankly been led astray by this to see that this connects with their faith tradition, but also, you know, big enough to help other people of faith and people not not of any particular faith, but who have some, you know, moral grounding for their lives, some you know, way they make sense of the world to see that this this is about their values. This is about, you know, the, the story of how we understand who we are and what we're here for. So moral fusion organizing is about building a broad coalition that can make a moral argument in public for policies that impact the common good, you know, create a greater potential for a multi-ethnic democracy, and in particular, lift people from the bottom, right? Not like you, you were talking about the way trickle down is supposed to work. It, you know, if you're on the bottom, it seems it never gets there. The, the, the idea is that if you, if you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. So how can we have, you know, policy decisions and, and collective investments that, that, that lift people who are most marginalized in order to make this a society that's better for all of us? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the classic study of Rat Park when, you know, the, as I started studying the drug war and it, it was like, it makes so much more sense to do it from the bottom up. You know, you, you can see why these rats weren't even attracted to the drugs once they had the necessities. They yeah. had not even just the necessities of food and, and, and everything and a place to live, but also like fun things, <laughs> like yeah. things to keep them active and engaged with life. Um, yeah. It, it makes yeah, and of course, sense. you know the the war on drugs has been so racialized. But uh, part of the struggle right now is you know with the opioid crisis is running like wildfire through predominantly white communities, right? Because of the economic desperation in these places. So now you know we've got you know forty years of a story that says, oh, you know that's that that that's a problem of the black community. That's a problem of you right. know, immigrants. And now white folks are realizing, oh, our kids are dying, and so they're having to even renegotiate uh, how they understand um, drug policy because it, it it's directly impacting them. So those kinds of things I think create the possibility for fusion for people coming mm -hmm. together across the dividing lines. Um, but it's hard work because. The, the the forces that want to keep people divided really depend on that division in order to stay in power. The reality is, the reality is that the uh, the policy vision of those people who want to deregulate and give complete free reign to corp to corporations and have the government do as little as possible uh, to serve the public. That is a minority position. Mm -hmm. um, on polling on almost every issue, whether it's you know gun control or public education or access to health care, I mean we're sixty to as high as the eighties percent of Americans want the government to be involved in some way in these things to make sure that everybody has access to these things to make sure that there's some regulation of things that harm us. So most people want some government involvement in our lives because we recognize that without some order, uh, you know, the, 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 the baser nature of the people with power tends to uh, take over. Um, but as long as uh, these wedge issues and divide and conquer tactics can keep a coalition, uh, you know, of everyone else that's big enough to overwhelm, you know, not just the sort of, you know, existing um, power structure, but also the ways that the system itself has been rigged to make it easier to hold on to those things, you know, whether it's the electoral college or the, the, the way our, you know, um, Senate works. I mean, there are some structural things that make it difficult for even the majority of people's voices to be heard in politics. Right. But it, at any rate, all that exists. But but if if the majority of people can come together and form a coalition, uh, the people who use these tactics know there's more power there in a democracy than there is among the people who are trying to uh, split people up and and serve the corporations. And I think that's why we're seeing a real attack on democracy in the present uh, as the uh, 
white base that we talked about earlier that was identified by the Southern strategy has shrunk over time. It's shrunk because of you know various demographic trends, but but they followed that closely. And as it has shrunk, um, uh, folks who who want to to hold on to power know that uh, uh, democracy is dangerous to their power. And so we see, you know, mass campaigns to question the results of uh, of an election. We see voter suppression efforts. We see, uh, you know, mass efforts to just purge the rolls, uh, you know, to make it so that fewer people are able to vote next time around. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah, voting is just one platform that, that uh, has continuously been used <laughs> for the last many decades. Um, and even recently with, with uh, you know, things like water at the polls or, uh, you know, you talk a good bit about Rosanelle Eaton in your book. Um, I guess, you know, I'm kind of curious then where, like, where do you see this going? Like the hope of trying to engage these conversations and maybe even like, how can people listening be involved? Obviously you mentioned the poor people's campaign and, and going to Washington. Um, but how, like, how do we, how do we carry this forward? Is it, yeah. is it conversations? And then how do those conversations even happen? I, I don't know. Well, I talk about it sometimes and have written about it with my friend, uh, William Barber, as uh, th that we're living in a time when we need a third reconstruction. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you know American history, you know that after the Civil War, the Reconstruction era was when America tried to remake itself in order to uh, uh, have the formerly enslaved people be full citizens. Mm -hmm. And that took a lot of structural, like amendments to the constitution and right. new constitutions in Southern states and you know, law, lots of laws that were passed. And um, it was viciously attacked by uh, white supremacists. I mean, by people who called themselves white supremacists and who, uh, you know, retook the South uh, quite literally in the Jim Crow era. So the second reconstruction is what we usually call the civil rights movement and all the energy around that, that again, tried to rewrite the laws of the country so that the full participation of all people as citizens in the country, you know, could be made real. And that too has been resisted and fought by um, this movement that we're talking about as Christian nationalism. And so uh, we're at a moment here when I think we, we, we need to have a lot of work to remake a society that could be a multi-ethnic democracy. And you can call that work a third reconstruction. I think because of demographics, the reality is that if we don't have a successful third reconstruction, it's impossible to even maintain the uh, appearance or the hope of a democracy uh, going forward. So we're, I think we're going to uh, increasingly live in a sort of de facto, uh, uh, you know, corporately controlled oligarchy uh, that, uh, you know, we, we see lots of signs. I mean, do you generally think like, do you believe that we're not there yet? Like, you think there's still hope for a third reconstruction, or do you think it's? I do think there's hope for a third reconstruction. I think realistically, we have to say that we've 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 obviously never had a fully functioning multiracial democracy. Sure. Uh, so it you know it's not like there's some great past to get back to. Right. But I'm saying we have up until this point maintained the hope. You know the the, the hope of the poet Langston Hughes, who says, "America never was America to me." And yet I swear this oath America will be. You know, there, there's been this hope that the kind of aspirational language that we have even in our founding documents could be achieved by collective work and commitment together. Uh, I think if we don't have a third reconstruction, we 
uh, we, we, we give up that hope. And that means giving in to the cynicism, which is very much here kind of, you know, on all sides. Um, I mean, there's a lot of political disengagement. There's a lot of, um, you know, people who are just sort of trying to figure out how to survive themselves. And um, I, I think increasingly that becomes the uh, reality. But we have to be honest about the fact that when you look around the world uh, in places where that's the political reality for most people, uh, the control of uh, society falls into the hands of authoritarians. And uh, we see that playing out, you know, in lots of, frankly, in lots of places, but uh, it's been very much before us in, in Ukraine. I mean, if you look over the last 15 years, I'm not saying that the U.S. and Russia have the same political history, but I'm saying if you look over the past 15 years of uh, the kind of culture war language that Putin's regime has used, and you know who they've demonized and what they've talked about in terms of the threats to their quote unquote traditional way of life. There are lots of parallels between that and the way the religious right has talked, which is why the religious right has loved Putin. Uh, you know, Franklin Graham has gone over and done events with Putin. Putin has been his guest at things. I mean, you know, the the whole like World Congress of Families which is a very religious right international movement, uh, was very keen on going to Russia and being hosted by Putin several years ago. So that 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 narrative has been there. And you see that it demonizes others in such a way that it creates a foundation for uh, a kind of uh, violence and insistence on, you know, um, uh, dominance and uh, the expansion of uh, control uh, by people who who, who believe that narrative. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's a very dangerous thing. Uh, we can see it sometimes when it's further away better than we see it when it's up close, but there are lots of similarities between uh, the tactics that have been used uh, there and by the religious right here. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of want to just take a step back before we end our time and kind of reiterate that what I feel like has been a, a, a main theme and just reiterate it, uh, you know, a lot of the interviews we've had surrounding Christian nationalism and the conversations we've had were predominantly about kind of how we got there um, and, uh, you know, how things like the, the moral majority, the family value movement, uh, uh, purity culture, all those were kind of like symptoms and things that happened. And, and I guess people really following to these like very specific ideas, theological values. Um, but what I keep coming back to for what I'm hearing you say is just this idea that what are maybe re almost re engaging with what are our values and understanding that maybe there's more commonality for those who are not in the power structure, which is most of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I mean, maybe even saying like uh, uh, value number one is being alive <laughs> and, and living a, a, a decent life. Yeah. Um, having, having your needs met Um and I think encouraging people to have that conversation, um, encouraging people maybe who are on both sides, right? Like it's not just this religious right, but even the left over here who are very angry and and driven in their things too. I know I know plenty of people that can't have a conversation with like a rural white person who voted for Trump. Yeah. Like they couldn't even yeah. have that conversation. And that's just as much of a problem, in my opinion, especially I, I think like I think I have plenty of left friends who definitely don't want an, an autocratic corporate driven democracy. But I'm almost feeling now, even after just this conversation, like people don't even realize the weight of where we're at if we don't come out of our comfort zone and have conversations because. Like if you don't engage with this person over here, who you don't see the eye to eye on everything, like, I don't care if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian and you think abstinence is stupid, 
Yeah. That doesn't matter right now. What yeah. matters is having that conversation, engaging on how none of us are getting, you know, what, what we need and want. Um, that's kind of what I, that, that's just, that's the feeling I'm getting. And, and I hope people listening to this can really walk away with just the exhortation to engage, engage, get out of your comfort zone, meet people, shake hands, um, have conversations and, and figure out how we can, build build bridges maybe instead of walls which was another rhetoric used i i know you're talking your book about wall builders wasn't that a thing was that was wall builders a uh political movement if i'm not mistaken or it's it's uh, a <laughs> the organization that has probably uh, done more than any other to, to push this idea that christian nationalists were the founders of the country mm. uh that, that they teach that and uh promote that as a vision but i i like what you're saying i think i think you're right um, the the culture wars were, of course, designed to give white religious people, uh, you know, reasons to hate their perceived liberal neighbors. But it's also the case that it has Im- it has impacted society in such a way that it's it's given lots of people who think of themselves as progressive reasons to hate their. Uh, more right-wing neighbors and family and friends. And of course the uh, whole Trump era just sort of ratcheted that up and gave it a little, I think it's both personality stuff and also the prevalence of social media just gave people a platform where they could kind of argue that stuff out every day. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, what, what the people who designed this believe is that they will benefit from division, right? Because if if people are fighting each other, then they can't unite to resist them. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about you know people who are, have self interest in a kind of corporate autocracy, mm-hmm. um, who want corporations to rule the world. And let's be honest, you know, for all practical purposes, corporations do mostly rule the world. <laughs> but, but, but the but the mediating. You know, the, the mediating institution that we have against that right now is democracy, right? We have right. a government that can regulate corporations, that can tax corporations, that can say to corporations, uh, like, you have to negotiate with your workers through a labor relations board. Like, I mean, these are concrete things um, that I think they would very much like to do away with. And the only hope we have of, of holding on to these things is uh, building a coalition. That that does include people who don't agree with each other on lots of stuff. Like that's, right. I think it's a given. I mean, life is complicated. I'm not saying you know we, we got a big wide rainbow coalition that's all thinking the same way. <laughs> I'm just saying pe- right. people who can, at a base level, you know, be committed to uh, doing the work of of building community, the work of building community that makes democracy possible. I think is. Uh, the work of a third reconstruction. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> Let's have a third reconstruction. Um, you know, Jonathan, thank you so much. I, I know we could go for way longer and there's a million other things I'd love to just hear you talk about. Um, so folks, I, I guess my encouragement is, is first go, uh, go pick up Jonathan's book. Uh, there's so many other good books out there. He mentioned uh, Dr. William Barber. Uh, check him out. Check his books out. Uh, and definitely check out the Poor People's Campaign. Um, I, I would be very proud and happy if even just one person goes to that. Um, and we're going to continue to process how we can, as a company and myself, be engaged in these conversations on a local level, building community, and trying to unite people Um in the face of corporate autocracy. So um, Jonathan, thank you so much for your time and uh, look forward to getting this posted so people can check it out. Well, thank you. Good to be with you. Get mad. Get mad, please, coffee.